It finally happened, I'm buying a multi-million dollar multi-family property. I don't know if you're freaking out, but I'm freaking out a little, so let's talk about it. What's up guys? A few months ago, I posted the first video in this million dollar property series, and here's what I had to say. I want to go bigger. It took me about 10 months from my first wholesale deal to now to get to a million dollar portfolio. And today, I'm gonna start my search for a million dollar property. Well, I've got an update for you guys. Not only did I find a million dollar property, I found a $2.1 million 33 unit apartment complex and I have it under contract. But before I dive into all of the details, I ask you to do one thing and that's subscribe. Most people don't subscribe to a channel simply because they're not logged into their YouTube account and they don't feel like logging in, but that is the single most thing that you could do to help out this channel. And if you are already subscribed, don't forget to change the color of the like button. My goal is to make this the best real estate investing channel on YouTube, so if you agree, let me know by doing one of those two things. That said, I know you guys have a lot of questions about this deal, so here's how I'm gonna break everything down. I'll go over how I found the deal as well as more details about about it, what my strategy is to finance and make money from it, as well as go through a ton of questions that you guys have left for me here on YouTube and over on Instagram. And I'll finish up with a little bit of advice for those of you who might wanna get into the multifamily real estate space, but aren't exactly sure what it would be like to move from single families to bigger properties or to jump straight to bigger properties like this. So. Let's do it. This is my very first time buying anything that's more than two units. So I have quite a few properties, but they're all either single family or duplexes. And so jumping from two units at a time to 33 units at a time is a big leap. I am not an expert in multifamily real estate. I never claim to be. Just like the rest of my channel, this video is about documenting my journey and sharing what's happening with you guys in real time. There's not a lot of channels out there from people who are actually on their journey and in the process of building their business. If you wanna go watch someone who's bought millions of dollars in multifamily real estate and claims to be an expert, go ahead and do that. That's not what this video is for. This isn't a blueprint on how to do things or me telling you what you should or should not do. This is me sharing what's happening in real time with you guys. So this deal was a lead from a direct mail campaign and I actually have some letters. Let me show you what they look like. Okay, so here's one of the letters. This was a direct mail campaign that I did through ballpoint marketing letters. And there's two things I really like about these letters is one, this is obviously not like a traditional, um, just white letter envelope. It's shaped a little differently. And of course it has this beautiful bold pattern. If somebody gets this in the mail, they're way more likely to open it than if they just get like a regular white letterhead. Second thing I really like, and I'm actually gonna open this one up because it's it's just a sample, but I wanna show you guys is that it's called ballpoint marketing because they have robots that hold pens that write out the letters. So it's less expensive than if you were going to hire someone or do it yourself to actually write the letters out because a robot's doing it. But it also looks way more personalized than if you were just to have a letter that was typed up, you know, and printed out. And I've actually had people who've responded to this direct mail campaign say like, hey, I got the letter you wrote me. So, you know, really thinking that this is actually handwritten, it's more personalized. It just gets you really started with like building rapport with the seller. Now this video isn't sponsored by anyone, but I did actually DM the owner of Ballpoint Marketing and ask him if he could give you guys a discount if you were to buy any letters for your next direct mail campaign. And so you can get 10% off your order at ballpointmarketing.com. They have these really cool letters and they also have these comic postcards. I'll put a picture of one on the screen and I'm definitely gonna try those out in my next direct mail campaign. So if you just go to ballpointmarketing.com and you put in Lily at checkout, that'll give you 10% off either one of those. So if you're ready to try a direct mail campaign, then want to try out these letters, go get your discount. Now, one big question is like, how do I find leads? Okay, I have these letters, I'm gonna get my 10% off, but who do I send them to? So in episode one of this series, I showed you guys how I went driving for dollars on the Deal Machine app, and that's where I logged the properties so that I could have the leads to send these letters to. So one good thing about driving for dollars is that it's a very customized list. And so you're driving around your area and you're logging the properties that you visually identify as distressed or as interesting to you for some reason. And so no one else is likely to have that exact same list of properties. And so you may find homeowners who no one's reached out to before and you're the first person calling them versus if you were to just pull a very typical list that anyone else is gonna pull, then you might be calling someone that's consistently getting calls from other investors and other wholesalers, not to say that those lists don't work, but it's just nice to have a custom list that you've created based on properties that you've visually identified. But on the other hand, it takes a long time to drive for dollars and log a bunch of properties.
properties. Like I could literally go on my laptop right now and pull 3,000 leads and it would take me a very long time to drive around and, five th and find 3,000 leads. So for this entire ballpoint marketing direct mail campaign that we're doing, we're gonna be sending out 5,000 pieces of mail. Now that doesn't mean that 5,000 are going to 5,000 different people. We may remail some people um, if we're not able to get in contact with them. Anyway, 5,000 of these letters are gonna get sent out, but we only sent out 400 for the first mail drop. But when I was driving for dollars, I was only able to log around 50 properties. So I still had about 350 you know, leads to gather that I didn't get from driving for dollars. And so for that, I used PropStream. Now, I know there's a lot of questions on the internet right now around PropStream and their loss of MLS data and if it's still worth it. I still pay for PropStream every single month. I have since I started this channel. Um, but if you guys want a more in-depth video on PropStream and some of the changes that are going on there, be sure to comment your favorite emoji down below. And if I get enough of those, then I will definitely make a video on my thoughts and kind of what's going on there. I'll also reach out to some of the people at PropStream and see if I can get you guys some direct answers from them and yeah, maybe maybe that'll help. So on PropStream to get those 350 extra leads, I pulled lists for you know geographic regions that I was interested in, just knowing what my investing area is. And then I was looking for two to four unit properties, but also five plus unit properties that have been owned for five years. I think I did five years. Yeah, I think five or 10 years, but I think I did five years or more. And the reason is I'm looking for value add properties. So the same way with like, if it was a single family property and somebody just flipped a house and sold it, I don't really wanna buy it from the person who just bought it because if, it, if they just bought it, it's probably in good condition or they're planning on fixing it up themselves. I really want some a property that maybe is, is on the end of the life cycle where it's just in distress condition and I can go in and fix it up and I can go in and add some value and make my profit that way. So that's why I didn't choose properties that were just recently purchased. I want something that's been owned a little while, maybe the owners are tired of it or something like that. So once I had the leads gathered and the letters sent out, I used an answering service called Call Porter. So there's a phone number on all of those letters, but that number is not my cell phone. Why is my flashlight on? Um, that letter's not my cell phone. I don't need, you know, 5,000 people having my cell phone number. That number actually goes into my new CRM. And I'm, the reason I'm name dropping a bunch of softwares right now is because as my business has grown, it makes sense to invest in different things. Like I said, this video isn't sponsored. Everything I'm mentioning to you guys right now, I actually use and actually pay for on a monthly basis. Um, I will link if they've given me the chance to give you guys a, a seven day trial or a discount, I will link those things below, but I'm not just name dropping for the sake of it. These are things that I use and pay for. So if you want to check them out, then you at least know somebody who likes them. But um, that number that's on these letters goes to a number that basically calls in through my CRM, which is Resimply. And this is basically a system, and I'm gonna have a whole video dropping about this and how I use it. This is basically the system that logs all of my leads. So you can see all the letters that were sent out, and you can also see all the people that actually called back. So out of the, I think 400 letters, how many did we send out? We sent out 395 exactly, and we received 13 responses. So that's a 3.3% response rate. I don't really know if that's good or bad, Again, this is my first time doing it, but I will know that for this first one, we got 3.3% and we'll see if, you know, that goes up. There's still plenty of time for some of those people to continue to call. We'll see what happens in the future, basically. But that number calls the system and I don't have to answer, but through the CRM re-simply, call Porter, a phone answering service for real estate agents, answers the phone and re-simply records that phone call so that I can listen to it later. And as call porters kind of gathering information from the person and building rapport with them, they can take notes on everything that they're learning and then they can automatically book a time on my calendar for me to meet that seller at their property and have an appointment to hopefully get a contract signed. So I tell call porter, hey, I'm available every day from 12 to 2 p.m. to go on appointments and then they can look at my calendar and then put that on my schedule. Now, when I mentioned call porter in a previous video, somebody left this comment, they said call porter is okay, but you save more money by using a VA. And you know what? This is true, but cheaper is not always better. And saving money, I think, is really an amateur mindset. And I don't mean that negatively, but I just mean that you can never get something for nothing. And I have nothing against VAs, but cheaper is not always better. If you hire the cheapest VA you can get, it's gonna show in the quality of work that they're gonna be able to produce for you. Especially if you yourself are not equipped and experienced enough to train that VA to do all of the necessary things when they're taking that call. Mainly build rapport, 
gather information that's important. Just all of those things, you know, speak intelligently about real estate in the industry. If the seller has questions, all of those things matter. And so if you're going to drop a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars on reaching out to leads, but you're going to go cheap on who answers the phone when those leads call, that's not the best business model to me. It's the same thing that people say when they're looking for the cheapest skip tracing available, where they're looking to get seller's contact information. Cheaper isn't always better. I know people who go cheap on the skip tracing, but then are confused why every number is a disconnected number or goes to the wrong owner. Well, you kind of get what you pay for. So again, nothing against VAs. I know tons of people who use VAs and have a great experience, but I think you want to not only make decisions based on price. You want to consider things other than that, especially things like quality and are they actually going to be able to get the job done. So for me, it's worth it to have call Porter answer my calls because I already know that they're trained and I personally just don't have the time to train up VAs to answer the phone calls now because time is money. That would be taking away from something else that I could be doing that, you know, in my opinion right now is more valuable, more beneficial to my business. So that's how I got this 33 unit lead. It was one of those 395 letters that we sent out. The seller called the number and I actually got an alert on my phone from Resimply that like a phone calls just came in, the call porter person is on the phone with them now. And so as soon as they hung up, I went and listened to the recording, which kind of made me feel like a spy. Like I was getting a little bit of insight into the seller and their vibe and their way of speaking and just what they were looking for before they even got the chance to speak to me. So I feel like I had a little bit of a head start when I immediately called him back and we just started to have a conversation. I learned on that phone call that there were 33 units, that three of them were currently vacant, but that he was in the process of turning after the last tenant left and putting a new tenant in. Of course, I'd asked him what made him respond to my letter and he said that he was actually trying to sell this property and he had sent it out to his own personal network and list of buyers, but he didn't want to pay any agent commissions because if you think about it, agent commissions on a 2.1, he was selling it for $2.1 million, but 6% for the agents on $2.1 million is it's $126,000 less in his pocket. Um, and he's a very successful real estate investor. So he had a pretty big network that he could send it to, but he figured he's already selling it. I sent him this handwritten letter. He thought it was handwritten and uh, he might as well call me back and give me a chance to get my offer in. He also told me that he owns thousands of units and that this 33 unit is the smallest one in his portfolio. And I Googled him and kind of did some research as I'm sure he did you know, he probably Googled me too, but I found that he literally just closed on a 650 unit um, package deal. And so he's playing in the big leagues and he wants to get rid of this 33 unit, which is what he told me. I don't know if he's gonna be using that for a 1031 exchange where he's gonna take the money from this sale and use it towards another one, but it's definitely possible. He doesn't live in my local area. He lives out of state. He set me up with his property manager who I met the next morning to walk through some of those vacant units. And as you can see, this isn't like the most upscale property, but again, I was pretty excited about it because I am looking for a value add deal. I don't want something too big to tackle for this first big project, but I do want something that, you know, gives me a little bit of work, a little bit of room that I have to grow some profit. If you think about what a lot of investors are looking for in single family or small multifamily are distressed properties that they can, you know, renovate or add value in some way so that they can receive that profit on the back end. And that's the same thing that I'm looking for just on a bigger scale and with a longer timeline than it would take to do with a single family house. Now I'm no expert at underwriting multifamily deals. And so I'm, I'm not going to try to teach you guys that, but one of the big basics to understand is that single family and small multifamily four units or less are valued very differently than big multifamilies five units and up for those smaller deals say I have a three bedroom two bathroom that sold for 200,000 in this neighborhood well another three bedroom two bathroom in that same neighborhood in similar condition should probably sell for the same amount that's how single family properties are used by by looking at comparable properties what's this one worth if it's comparable to this one, they should be worth about the same. But when you get over five units, that goes completely out of the window. Because if you think about it, how likely is it that I'm going to find a comparable 33 unit complex in a similar area in similar condition as this one that has recently sold? Very unlikely. So instead of using comps, valuing larger properties like this, use the NOI or the net operating income, which you can think of as all of the income minus all of the expenses, except the mortgage payment. So you don't include the actual payment on the debt 
in that expense calculation. If this stuff interests you and you actually wanna get into this, you definitely should read Multifamily Millionaire Volumes 1 and 2 from Bigger Pockets. Those were books that I listened to on Audible on repeat as I'm continuing to go through this deal. I will link them in the description for you. With the NOI, the net operating income, to value the property is actually using a very simple formula. It's that the value of the property is the NOI divided by the cap rate. Now, I'm not even gonna try to explain cap rate to you guys. Go read Multifamily Millionaire. But a good thing to know is that every market has a cap rate that properties are generally selling around. I didn't know what the cap rate in my area was, and so I reached out to a bunch of people that I met through wholesaling or that I've networked with through my own investing and asked them what's a cap what's a good cap rate in this area for a 33 unit complex? I learned that in my market, well stabilized properties, meaning ones that are in good condition, that have good occupancy, that are just running smoothly, sell at about a 4% cap. Whereas properties that are in poor physical condition or running poorly, have high vacancy, high amounts of people not paying the rent, things like that, they're selling at about a 7% cap rate. Again, Monsai Family Millionaire does a really good job of explaining this. I'm just giving you an overview to see if this like, you know, Gets you, gets you going, gets you excited as something you might wanna dive into or something you might wanna learn a little bit more about. So my property is not in prime condition, so it's not a 4% cap, and it's also not in horrible condition, so it's not a 7% cap. So let's say, for this example, that it's somewhere in the middle and it's called a 5.5% cap rate. So the only other thing we need to determine to start looking at what this property might be worth, what might be a good purchase price for it, is that NOI, which again, is just income minus expenses, ignoring the mortgage payment. And because the seller was already looking to sell this property, he had all the financials, like the trailing 12 months of all of his income and expenses, his rent roll, all of the documents that you're gonna need, he had those available, so he sent them over to me, and I was able to go through them and get an idea of what is that NOI. Let's say it came out to $115,000 per year, the income minus expenses per year, ignoring the mortgage payment. We would then take that $115,000 and divide it by the 5.5% cap rate and get $2.1 million as the property value. From there, we need to think about our value add strategy, similar to what we would do with a Burr deal. If this was a single family house, I would say, okay, it's worth this today, but if I was to fix it up, how much could it be worth, you know, in three months or six months when I'm done with it? In this case, I'm not looking at a three or six month timeline, I'm looking at a longer timeline, but it's the same type of thought process. But with NOI, it's actually much easier to determine how much the value is going to increase. Because remember, NOI is just income minus expenses. So we can increase that NOI by either one, increasing income, or two, decreasing expenses. And if we can do both, then we've got an even bigger spread. The bigger the gap we can create as the income goes up and the expenses go down, then the more we have increased the value by increasing the NOI. For example, if the NOI is currently 115,000 and we increase it $10,000 a year by adding an on-site laundry facility in the basement, and then we decrease it by 10% per year by hiring a more efficient property manager, then we've created a $20,000 gap. We've taken our NOI from 115 up to 135. So if we put that back into our formula and we now have 135 NOI divided by 5.5% cap rate, that gives us 2.4 million as our property value instead of 2.1. But remember, the cap rate moves as the property becomes more well stabilized. So with the better condition that this property is now in, let's say instead of being a 5.5% cap rate, maybe it's now a 5% cap rate, which would give us 135,000 divided by that new 5% cap rate, which would increase the value to 2.7 million. So as you see, we've added $600,000 of value to the property by increasing the NOI and decreasing the cap rate. It's just a rough example of how that might work as adding value to a property that's more than five units. You're no longer looking at, okay, well, if I put granite countertops, this is gonna sell for more, it's gonna get appraised for more. That's just not how it works. It's not that subjective when you're doing larger multifamily. It's much more objective in terms of what are the income, what are the expenses, and what is the area's cap rate, which I think is actually much more straightforward and there's less guesswork involved. Now, of course, it's not as easy to stabilize and run a multifamily property as it is maybe a single family or a duplex, and the same way you have a rehab cost when you're looking at a relatively small property, you're also gonna have not only a rehab cost, but just like an improvement budget that also has to be worked into the value that you're adding, but all of that is more in the weeds than this video needs to get. Again, this is just an overview. I will link some multifamily videos in the description. So with so many new things happening on this deal, how am I pulling this off? How am I financing it? 
I'm getting a partner. In this TikTok, I showed you guys that I had a 1% deposit to go under contract on this deal. That is an earnest money deposit, which is very different than a down payment. So let me explain the difference a little bit for you guys. Earnest money is something that goes along with a contract. So basically, I take my money and I take my contract and I give it to the title company. The contract is signed by both parties and the earnest money is there to basically, it's called consideration. It's basically me putting my money where my mouth is and saying I intend to follow this contract and close on this deal. Now, I've seen commentary both ways that a contract is not really legit without earnest money and I've seen people say that a contract could be accepted with it, but having that earnest money is like the stamp of legitimacy on your contract. Now, my earnest money is refundable for a certain amount of time while I'm doing my due diligence, while I'm getting inspections and I'm just going through the process to make sure I wanna close on this property. It is refundable. There's a date on the contract at which that earnest money becomes non-refundable. So that is 1%. And in my market, 1% earnest money is typical. So on this $2.1 million, has put down $21,000. Where did I get that money? wholesaling. Now the down payment is different than earnest money and down payment you don't have to have until the day that you're closing on the deal. So earnest money is given when you go under contract and let's say it's going to be a 45 day closing. 45 days later when you're at the title company is when the down payment is given. If it's a $2.1 million deal and we go to a bank we say hey we want a loan to buy this property they might say okay we'll give you 75% of that $2.1 million so you need to come up with the other 25% which would be $525,000. On top of that if we're trying to improve the NOI and make this property worth more, we're gonna have to have some cash for that. So let's say all in all for the down payment and for our improvement budget, we're gonna need 600 grand. So I don't have 600 grand sitting in the bank, so I'm bringing in a partner for that, but I'm also bringing in a partner for their expertise because this is my first time going into this type of deal, but every investor in the world pretty much is looking for deals like this. And so having a partner who's a little bit more experienced and can bring some or all of that cash is really gonna help me get my feet wet. Right now, I'm actively taking meetings with all of those potential partners. So that means my mentors, that means people I've wholesaled to in the past, people I've met networking, people who I've just put out on Facebook in my local investing group. Hey, I've got a 33 unit deal, I'm looking for a partner, DM me. And when I tell you everyone wants this type of deal, so I have so many meetings, but it's also great because I have so many eyes on this deal that if I've done something wrong in my underwriting, because again, it's my first time underwriting a legitimate deal, I have practiced on other deals, but this is the first time like writing a check and underwriting a deal, then I have so many eyes on it. So that if there's something I'm doing wrong, then those other more experienced investors are gonna catch it. Now, how this partnership is gonna be structured is still up in the air. I don't know, every partnership is different. And so I might have a partner who says, hey look, I'll bring 400 grand, you bring 200 grand, and here's the percentage ownership that will split. I might have a partner that says, hey, I'll bring it all. I might, you know, there, there could be any multitude of scenarios and how you structure a partnership is really up to you and that person. Um, so things like what LLC is it gonna go into? What's our percentage ownership? What's our exit strategy? Are we selling it in two years? Are we selling it in five years? Are we not selling it and we're gonna refinance it? What happens to the cash flow? All of that will be hammered out with whatever partner I end up choosing to move forward with. Now, let's dive into some more of the questions that you guys asked. The 1% deposit was definitely the main question, but there were some other really good ones that I wanna answer for you guys. So, someone said, love this, what form of marketing did the apartment complex lead come from? This was a lead that was pulled on PropStream, but that I used ballpoint marketing direct mail to mail the letter to the address for the owner that was found on PropStream. Do you use an LLC to buy all these properties? Are they registered under your name? And how did you do manage to do the 1%? So we talked about that. That's what said, Lily, you're a beast, your channel's really inspiring and helpful. I appreciate that, guys. Like I said, the entire point of this channel is to bring you guys on this journey with me, and so I'm just giving it to you real as it happens. But to answer the LLC question, I started off wholesaling just in my personal name because I didn't have any ownership of those properties. This isn't financial or legal advice, but I didn't have any ownership of those properties, and I wasn't concerned about getting sued or having any liability on the deal. Now, as I started to wholesale more, I did get an LLC, and I also purchased my properties in an LLC's name just so that I do have basically on the advice of my lawyer that there's a difference between Lily the person and Lily the LLC that holds the houses so when you start to get to that level and you're thinking about do I want to purchase this property in an LLC the best thing that you could do is invest some money in a lawyer because it's gonna pay for itself in the long run to make sure that you're legally protected and doing things the correct way versus again trying to not spend money 
just because it's spending money. You gotta start looking at things as like, this is spending, this is investing. And if I'm investing in a lawyer, it's probably one of the best investments I could make. Hey, Lily, you go, girl. Thank you. Will you be airbnb any of the units? So this particular property is not in an area that I would Airbnb, even if it was a single family. This is just more of an area that's, it's just not good for Airbnb. It's not like close to downtown. It's not close to the airport. It's just like a normal, residential area and also the way that the property is set up it just wouldn't be very convenient for somebody to come in and out you know parking constantly it's like it's great for the people that live there but it wouldn't be great to navigate if it was like your first time as an airbnb -er. but i was out of town recently and i stayed at an apartment complex that did have some long-term tenants and also had some airbnbs and that was really cool so if future deals are in different areas that could be something to explore like having a mixed complex some long-term some airbnb and then depending on how the financials look maybe even having an entire complex that's airbnbs I don't know, but I am doing my first Airbnb right now. It's actually a garage apartment, so much smaller than 33 units. If you guys wanna check out this video right here, I'll link it in the description below so you can see how I furnished my first Airbnb and how all that's going. This where I said, does every unit need renovating and how much does it usually cost? So every unit doesn't need work. In fact, we're planning on all 33 units being occupied at closing. So a lot of the value add in this deal are things like Increasing income, like we said, be adding um, laundry facility into the basement. Those will be coin laundry machines. And even if it's just 25, 50 cent per load, over time, that's gonna be a good profit. And it's also a great service for the residents because having a laundry facility on site, since there isn't laundry in the actual apartments, that's gonna be much cheaper and convenient for them than taking their laundry you know, over to the laundromat rather than just doing it right there in the basement. So the money being spent on this value add deal is not necessarily in the improving the units themselves. Now, part of that money is gonna be set aside for outstanding maintenance requests. So if there are things that residents are like, hey, I've had a leaky dishwasher or my lights are flickering or you know, just anything that's wrong with the units, we will be taking care of those things because that's, I think that's the right thing to do. But most of the money going into the complex is gonna be like the laundry facility, vending machines, um, and then on the decreasing expenses side is like getting new contracts for the lawn care, um, for property management, just all of the little line on expenses that come with running a property this big and taking a good look at those and thinking about, okay, where can we decrease expenses without decreasing the quality of, you know, the living experience for the tenants themselves. Do you have investment partners in this deal? I am working on that now. Now, if you made it to this part in the video, I have a surprise for you guys. It's gonna come in just a moment, but three pieces of advice for you. If you wanna get into bigger deals, or if you just wanna get into real estate in general, first, read, read, read. In every video, I link book descriptions in the description because I think that YouTube videos are so helpful and YouTube videos are so helpful to me and I hope mine are helpful to you. And also, reading like an investor, the 30 years of their career condensed into a $12 book it's just like the best investment you can make. Usually books walk you from A to, three of, a to Z of the process. They've thought about the questions you need, they have extra resources. Read, read, read. Second, get a partner who has some experience. And then third, don't sweat the haters. Somebody asked, am I looking for partners on this deal? I mentioned I posted in my local Facebook group about, hey, I have a 33 unit deal under contract. I'm looking for a partner. And most people are just like, I'm DMing you. Here's my email, let's talk about it. And then there's this guy. Now, I went back and forth on including his name here or not. I mean, Facebook is public and he publicly decided to be a jerk, but I decided I don't want you guys putting your energy towards going to find him and send him hate. He'll get whatever the universe wants him to get, but he literally just like saw my page that I have a YouTube channel and decided that somehow I was a scammer, which it doesn't really make sense. How am I gonna scam you by saying I have a deal under contract? Like I don't see what the next step is there. But anyway, everyone is not gonna like what you're doing. But don't be afraid to put yourself out there because there's so many other people that will support you. Like all of you guys, we just crossed 100K, we'll be having the celebration video soon, but all of you guys have supported me and encouraged me to continue on in this journey and that's the people that I wanna give energy to and continue to give back to. I also got a comment from Ryan Dossie, who's actually the owner of Ballpoint Marketing. He's the one giving you guys 10% off if you use the code Lele at checkout, just saying that he's so happy for me. So I appreciate everyone that supported me. I hope you guys got your questions answered about this deal. Of course, I'll be following up and showing you guys more of what's happening. Next up, we're gonna be having the inspection at the property. We're having inspectors go through all 33 units, through the boiler room, through the attic, look at the roof, 
everything, so I'll be bringing you guys along on that. In the meantime, check out the rest of this series right here if you missed the previous episodes. And I've also got this video right here, which is a good one if you wanna get started in real estate. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video.